So happy Sabbath, Israel. For those who don't know, my name is Brother Tony P. I'll be your teacher today. And reading for us is our beloved Brother D. Lee. Go ahead, D. Lee. Uh, Exodus chapter 20. We're going to read verses 1 through 17. Whenever you get it, brother, go ahead and read. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, Amen. nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Amen. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Thank you, D. Lee. So, sisters and brothers, he just read the Ten Commandments that the Lord himself gave to Moses. And let's get a second witness of this right now. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We just read the law from the lawgiver Moses, and now we want to see what the wisest man who ever lived, King Solomon, say about the commandments. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, my brother. Let's read 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. Whenever you get it, go ahead and read. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Amen. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So sister and brothers, this is why we teach and keep the commandments because the book says all of us have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and every man will be judged according to his works. So you might say, well, Brother Tony, you only read the Old Testament. We're in the New Dispensation now. So now let's go to Revelation, the 22nd chapter. Let's see if we can see the commandments in the book of Revelation. This is the very last book of the Bible, the very last chapter, Revelation 22. And Brother D. Lee, let's read verses 14 and 15. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Go ahead. That they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. So sister and brothers, if we want to get into the Lord's kingdom, we have to keep his commandments, plain and simple. So what we want to do, sister and brothers, go ahead and get started with the lesson. The title of the lesson is, Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. Once again, behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, correcting the false doctrine of preterism. 
And sisters and brothers, the reason why we decided to do this lesson today is because you have many people out here teaching a doctrine that Matthew chapter 24 has been completely fulfilled already. They teach that it's been fulfilled back in 70 AD. In fact, they teach that all end time biblical prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD with the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. Now I've heard this before about maybe 10 years ago and I didn't really pay it attention because I knew it was false then and I know it's false now. But the sad thing is, sister and brothers, is that this doctrine now is creeping back into the household of faith. And unfortunately, the worst part is, this doctrine is being taught by former students of the Israel of God. Notice I said the word former, and that's where they belong, being former, teaching that bad doctrine. So we're gonna correct that today, sister and brothers, Lord willing, because the Bible warns about a great falling away. And sister and brothers, we see this being fulfilled this very day. And the Bible also teaches that there is nothing new under the sun. And this doctrine that they teach has a name, and the name of that doctrine is called preterism. And what we would do with this lesson, sister and brothers, we would define what preterism is, and we will see if it lines up with the scriptures. So if we could, Brother D. Lee, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I always like to start here because it's so relevant even to this very day. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we want to pick this up at verses 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and let's pick this up at verse 15. Because sisters and brothers, we are now in the season of deception. In fact, this is chitlin season. I was in Walmart yesterday and I saw some chitlins on display. In fact, I saw two cases of chitlins on display. Now, notice I didn't say I was in Johns Creek. I wasn't in Doraville. I wasn't in more, some of the more affluent areas, Walmart. I was down the street on Panola. Because they make sure they serve us all that abomination so we can sin before our God. Mm -hmm. But that's what we get when the preacher tells you every Sunday that the law is done away with. But let's read this book, 2 Timothy chapter 2, my beloved brother, and it starts at verse 15. When you get it, go ahead and read. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you got to study this book, sisters and brothers, and you got to rightly divide the word of truth. Go ahead, verse 16. But shun profane and vain babbling. So when somebody's not rightly dividing, sisters and brothers, all you hear is a lot of gobbledygook, a lot of vain babbling and profane speaking. Go ahead. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now usually when I read this, I usually read 15 and 16, and I usually skip down to 23. But today, we want to continue, and we want to read 17 and 18. So we're still in 2 Timothy chapter 2, but I want D. Lee to read verses 17 and 18. Go ahead, brother. And their word will eat as doth a canker. So now the Lord, uh, Paul is saying that those who don't rightly divide the word of truth, and they do a whole lot of vain babbling, he says their word will eat up as doth a canker. A canker is a tumor, sister and brother. It's more like a cancer. Go ahead. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. So these two brothers here during the days of Paul, they was teaching a whole lot of bad doctrine too, and that bad doctrine was spreading through the body of Christ like a cancer. And you got to nip it off in the bus, sister and brothers, or else it will infect everybody in the congregation. And this doctrine right now that they're teaching in Matthew 24 has been completely fulfilled. That doctrine is trying to infect people, but we got the penicillin shot for it. It's called the Word of God. Go ahead, verse number 18. Who, concerning the truth, have erred. Now these two dudes, Hymenaeus and Philetus, during Paul's day, the book says they have erred concerning the truth. What did they teach? Saying that the resurrection is past already. Now these two dudes in Paul's day taught that the resurrection had already happened. They taught that the first resurrection had already passed. Well, according to the scriptures, when the first resurrection happens, you're going to see Jesus Christ coming. So this bad doctrine of Matthew 24 being fulfilled, this ain't nothing new, sister and brothers. They were teaching it back in Paul's day, and they're teaching it to this very day right now. And just like Paul corrected them with the scriptures, we're going to correct them with the scriptures if they can receive it. Start 18 again, brother. Who, concerning the truth, have erred. Go ahead. Saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. And they're messing it up so bad that they are overthrowing the faith of some sisters and brothers, and they're trying to get them to leave the truth to follow their folly. 
Well, let's continue with this, y'all. Let's go now to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Turn over one book. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's start this at verse number 13. And what we're doing right now, family, is we just building some foundation scriptures, and then we will get into the meat of the lesson momentarily. But right now, D. Lee, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And let's pick this up at verse number 13. We'll read 13 through 17. And whenever you get it, brother, go ahead and read. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So these false teachers out here, they ain't trying to feed the flock of the Lord. They're trying to pump themselves up. The book says that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse each and every time. They're going to deceive the people, but they themselves are also being deceived by that angel of light, which is Satan the devil. Go ahead, verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Go and ahead. And hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And sisters and brothers, I want y'all to really pay attention to that verse that he just read. He says, but continue you thou in the things which you have learned and have already, and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Go ahead, read verse 15. We'll tell you what that means. And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. So as a babe in Christ, sister and brothers, you come through the doors of the Israel of God, you got brothers like D. Lee and the other readers actually reading with us, said the Lord, and you reading it right along with them, so you know ain't no false doctrine being taught up in here. Mm -hmm. But then you got some brothers that want to stand up, that been in the truth for about three weeks, and all of a sudden they somebody great. Well, the Israel of God is teaching wrong. Brother Bowie is teaching wrong. Y'all need to follow me follow you where? To the lake of fire? That's exactly where you're going. You're teaching some bogus doctrine. That's right, bro. And we're going to show that in the book, sister and brothers. Y'all think I'm joking. I am dead serious. You got way too many novices out here because what does the book say? Knowledge puff it up. And you got so many brothers out here puffed up. But then my question is this. If you got all this understanding, how come the Lord has not blessed you with a congregation? And see all the scoffers that's talking crazy right now online, they didn't put their pencils down. Oh, he tripping. No, you tripping. <laughs> but start that again, verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Because all it's about, sisters and brothers, is teaching you with us, said the Lord, so we can get some of this salvation. All that other stuff, you can just leave it behind. Go ahead, verse number 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. No, Brother D. Lee, you read that wrong. It says some scripture. What does the book say? All scripture. Go ahead. Is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that's why we read with us said the Lord, sister and brothers, because we're trying to make this thing. Go ahead, finish it off in verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. Truly furnished unto all good works. Amen. That the man or the woman of God may be perfect in the eyes of the Lord, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But Paul is telling us, be careful out here because you got these wolves and all they trying to do, sister and brothers, is make merchandise of you. And we'll read that momentarily. But let's stay in the book of Timothy now and go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Just turn right back over. Because we got to point these false prophets out, sisters and brothers, because they come to you so smoothly. And I always say this, you never see them in Bible study. We have a weekly Bible study every Sabbath right after class, and you never see them there. But they're always out in the parking lot, or they're always out on social media, or they're always somewhere else sowing seeds of discord. And my thing is this, you got all this understanding. We got Wednesday night Bible study, you can call in for that. We got Sabbath night Bible studies, you can call in for that. You got most of our elders and teachers numbers. You can call any one of us. But you're afraid that we're going to open this book and read it and expose you. So you ain't going to do that. So you got to find a peanut gallery somewhere and try to whisper and sow those seeds of discord. But well, we're going to point them out today, sister and brother. So if they come to y'all with that madness, you know exactly what to do. Open up the book and read what thus said the Lord. First Timothy chapter 6, my beloved brother. And let's pick this up at verse number 12. First Timothy 6 and 12. And we're going to learn something else here. Go ahead. Fight the good fight of faith. He says, fight the good fight of faith. Go ahead. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on to eternal life. Salvation, go ahead. Whereunto thou art also called, and have professed a good profession 
before many witnesses. So what Paul is telling Timothy and telling all of us is to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. But then you got these same brothers teaching that we are already saved. If we are already saved, then what are we fighting for, sisters and brothers? Who did the song Fight the Power? It was the Ozzy Brothers first, right? And then Public Enemy, right? It wasn't the Rolling Stones, because they already got the power. What are they fighting for? <laughs> the Gentiles are the ones that have the power. Why would they fight the power? So if you already have salvation, why would you fight to hold on to it, sister and brothers? Does that make sense? So watch these seducers out here, because they think they slick. Go ahead, brother, verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession. Go ahead, verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot. So even Paul is telling Timothy and us, we still got to keep the Lord's commandments without spot and blemish. Go ahead. Unrebukable. Unrebukable. Until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's put on our thinking caps, sisters and brothers. Did Jesus appear during the time of Paul or during the time of Timothy? No, he did not. He didn't come back yet, sisters and brothers, but yet Paul is still telling Timothy what Jesus tells us to endure until the end and the same shall be saved. And he's telling Timothy to keep this commandment without spot until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Christ didn't appear during the time of Timothy, so he had to endure until the end, which is what? The end of his life. And that's what we have to do, sisters and brothers. We have to endure until the end. Whether the Lord comes back first or whether we die, whatever happens first, we got to endure until the end. We are not saved yet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Go ahead, brother. Uh, what verse was that? 14? Excuse Skip me. down to verse 20. Yes, sir. 20 and 21. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoid, avoiding profane and vain babblings. Paul is still warning us about profane and vain babblings. Avoid all those people doing that. Go ahead. And oppositions of science falsely so-called. And science is just talking about the knowledge, the knowledge of the word of the Lord. Go ahead. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith. And that's the second time he said it. Some of these brothers out here professing to be teaching the truth, they have air concerning the faith. Go ahead. Grace be with thee. Amen. Amen. The grace of the Lord be with us. Amen. A couple of more here, and then we want to give y'all a definition and get right into the middle of the lesson. Let's hit Acts 20 real quick. Acts chapter 20. Because Paul teaches us to mark them that cause division. And that's all that these brothers want to do is cause a whole lot of division. They ain't trying to feed the Lord's flock. They ain't trying to teach about salvation. All they want to do is have that finger pointing spirit, sisters and brothers. And we know what the Bible says, who the accuser of the brethren is. So if you run into a brother that's always finger pointing, always saying what the IG, IOG is and ain't doing, look at that spirit behind them, sisters and brothers. That's the accuser of the brethren, and we can tell y'all who that is. Acts chapter 20, my brother. And let's take this at verse number 28. Acts chapter 20. We want to read 28 through 30. When you get it, go ahead and read. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath which he have purchased with his own blood. So this is the Lord's church, sister and brothers. When you out here and you sowing discord and dissension amongst the flock, you are polluting the Lord's house and he gonna deal with you. Go ahead, 29 and 30. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And they here, sister and brothers, they are not trying to spare the flock. They are trying to tear up the Lord's salvation, his house. Go ahead, verse 30. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. Speaking perverse things, sisters and brothers. What does he mean by perverse things? The book talks about a perverted doctrine. They are teaching you that a Gentile is not a European, but a Gentile is actually an Israelite. <laughs> they are teaching you that a day don't begin in the evening, what the Lord said the evening in the morning was the first day. They'll tell you that a day begins at sunlight. And they'll tell you now that Christ is not gonna return in the clouds, that he's currently ruling from the heavens. And everything that you see about the future prophecy is nothing but symbolism, and it's a whole lot of metaphors. Sisters and brothers, they are teaching perverse things. Why? Start at verse 30 again. Verse 30. Yes, sir. Also, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, 
to draw away disciples after them. Because they want people to follow them because again, they want to be the big I and have everybody else be the little you. Mm -hmm. And the sad part about it is if you actually go and follow them and say, all right, brother, later for the IOG, I want to follow you, I like what you're teaching, where are we going to meet at this Sabbath? Well, I ain't really got a congregation yet, but I got this PayPal here, I got this Venmo here, I got this Zelle here, you go ahead and send me your tithes, and then once the Lord shows me where we can get a place, I'll get a place. But in the meanwhile, go ahead and send me your money and just don't show up nowhere else. Mm -hmm. I've seen that, sister and brothers. You ain't got no overhead, what you want tithes for? Social media is free. YouTube is free. Why are you collecting tithes? And I ran into another knucklehead that even claimed that he was Jesus Christ this week. He said that he was Christ on, um, what's that, Clubhouse. And he even had a cash app. Talking about sending him a donation. I'm like, what did Jesus need a cash app for? What did he tell Peter when he needed money to pay the tribute? Go send out a hook, catch a fish, and the gold's going to be in his mouth, and pay them with that? So if you truly Jesus, you go out there to the Chattahoochee, put you a line out there, see what fish comes up with some money in it, and that's it. Don't be asking for no cash app. But again, that shows you the level of perverseness out here with these false teachers yeah. thinking that they're somebody important. Yeah. And again, if y'all don't repent, the Lord got something for you. We're going to show y'all what that is momentarily. So be careful, sister and brothers, because these grievous wolves are out here. That's right. One more place we want to go. Let's hit John, 1 John, the fourth chapter. 1 John, chapter 4. That Negro said he was Christ. <laughs> and the sad part about it is three other ones that say that they're Christ too. They own clubhouse fighting. Which one is truly Christ? <laughs> If you put any one of them in a bathtub and try to walk on it, they all drown. <laughs> so you know the Lord ain't dealing with them. First John chapter 4. <laughs> Boy, First John chapter 4. We want to read verse number 1. Then we're going to skip to verse 6. First John chapter 4. We want to read verse 1. Then we want to skip verse number six. When you get it, D. Lee, go ahead and read. Beloved, believe not every spirit. Don't believe every spirit out here. Go ahead. But try the spirits. But whether test they, these spirits. Go ahead. Whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are going out into the world. That's all we've been talking about, sister and brothers. All these false prophets that's been going out of the world and John is telling us, don't believe every spirit. You got the right to question somebody, sister and brothers. If some dude says that the Lord sent him to teach you, and if some dude saying that he's Christ or this, that, or whatever, and some dude said that he had a vision from the angel, you have a right to question this brother with the book. And if they don't want to deal with the book, you know the Lord didn't send them. Go ahead, verse number six. Skip down to verse six. We are of God. Amen. He that knoweth God heareth us. Go ahead. He that is not of God heareth not us. Now the Lord is going to tell you about two different spirits that are in this world. Go ahead. Hereby know we the spirit of truth. So you got the spirit of truth out here, and the book says the word, the Lord of the, the word of the Lord is truth. Go ahead. And the spirit of error. And the spirit of error, just talking out the top of their head, not reading what thus saith the Lord. Right. And we want to make sure, sister and brothers, that we are not seduced by the spirit of error. Last place here, quickly, let's go to Isaiah chapter 28. Y'all all right today, fam? Yes, Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Isaiah chapter 28. It's a nice day today. Praise the Lord for another Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. Everybody else out there maxing out their credit cards for Christmas and all that, we walk right past it and come to the house of the Lord. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 28. And let's start this at verse number one. And we're going to do some skipping. Hold on, I still hear some pages. Mm -hmm. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. We're going to start this at verse number one. All right, Dealey, when you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower. Go ahead. Which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. So Ephraim, sister and brothers, is just another name for Israel. These are talking about the northern tribes, but it really uh, reflects all 12 tribes. 
He's talking about the drunkards. He's not talking about physical drunkenness. Go ahead, verse number seven. But they also have erred through wine and through strong drink or out of the way. So Israel is supposed to be the priests of the Lord. They're supposed to teach the people what thus said the Lord from Genesis to Revelation. But we are the main ones that's doing the most error, the ones that's supposed to be in the truth. Don't nobody kick against the Bible more like Israel. Right. When you deal with the Muslims, they may not, you know, do everything the Quran says, but they're not going to disrespect it publicly. When you deal with anybody in a different religion, the Buddhists, they ain't going to disrespect the Bible publicly. But when it comes to Jake, oh, man, that Bible is missing some books. Oh, I can read Jesus in here, but his name ain't Jesus because ain't no J's in the Hebrew. We are the only people that question our own Bible, and that's why we over here today speaking the King's English. King's English. Not doing what thus said the Lord in our own land. <laughs> but I digress. Start that again, verse 7. Praise the Lord. Go ahead. But they also have air through wine, and through strong drink are out of the way. And that wine is strong drink, sister and brother, is talking about this bad doctrine being taught. Right. Go ahead. The priests and the prophets have erred through strong drink. Go ahead. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. They are out of the way through strong drink. Go ahead. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. So they are out of the way through strong drink. They err in vision and they stumble in judgment, sister and brothers. And again, this is talking about spiritually, talking about being uh, inundated with bad doctrine. Because mm -hmm. you can drink you some uh, hard liquor, sister and brothers, and just wake up with a headache and it be over with. Well, if you got this bad doctrine on you, you're just walking around in a drunken stupor 24-7. And if you don't believe me, go to Walmart and watch them buy them red buckets of chitlins. Because pastor told them that the law is done away with, and they can eat whatever they want and pray over it, but then he's going to turn around and tell them to tithe on Sunday morning. Well, wait a minute. If the dietary law is done away with, how come the tithing law ain't done away with? And that's when we get kicked out of the church, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Verse number eight, go ahead. For all tables are full of vomit and filthiness, so that there is no, cle no place clean. So the Lord is saying all tables are full of vomit and filthiness. It's bad doctrine. And now what they doing, sisters and brothers, they regurgitating it left and right. They don't go to the Bible no more. They put the word of truth down, and now they want to go on the Internet, and they want to see, well, you know, I think Matthew 24 and all that stuff has been done away with already or it's been completely fulfilled. So there's no such thing as future prophecy. We got a name for that, sister and brothers, and it's called preterism. If you could bring that first slide up, Brother Chaz, and this is what we're going to deal with this, eat this afternoon, and this is called preterism. Theopedia.com, preterism. Oh, that's nice and professional. Okay, I like that. <laughs> Go ahead, brother. What does it say, Dealey? Preterism. Yes, sir. Preterism is a view in Christian eschatology. Go ahead. Which holds that some or all of the biblical prophecies concerning the last days refer to events which took place in the first century after Christ's birth. So what it's saying is that this is a Christian theology or eschatology that says that some or all biblical prophecy concerning the last days, which we are in right now, that these actually refer to events that took place in the first century after Jesus' birth. Go ahead especially the events associated with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So that's their watermark, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and they say that right there fulfilled all the future prophecies, the tribulation, and all that stuff. Go ahead. The term preterism comes from the Latin praetor. So this term is from the Latin word praetor. What does that mean? Meaning past. So that word praetor means past. Go ahead. Since this view deems certain biblical prophecies as past, or already fulfilled. And that's what some brothers that used to go to the Israel of God is teaching right now, this bad doctrine of preterism. They're saying all this stuff was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. They say that was the tribulation, that was the beast and the false prophet, and that was the second coming. But well, we're gonna take a look at that and see if it holds water. Go ahead and finish that, brother. Proponents of preterist views generally fall in one of two categories. So somebody says that they down with preterism, they fall in one of two categories. What's the first one? Partial preterism. Go ahead. Or full preterism. So they are either partial preterists or they are full preterists, which tells me, because the Lord said he don't want you to be partial in judgment, right? Right. So you're already erring right there. If you're a full preterist, your table is full of vomit. Period, point blank. We just read that, did we not? Mm -hmm. Go to the next slide if you could, Chaz. This is going to tell us what partial preterism is. Then we're going to read some book. Go ahead, brother. Partial preterism 
The older of the two views holds that prophecies such as the destruction of Jerusalem. So they're saying the destruction of Jerusalem. The Antichrist. The Antichrist. The Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. And the advent of the day of the Lord. And as, the day of the Lord, as he said in Joel chapter 2, go ahead. As a judgment coming of Christ where were fulfilled circa 70 AD. So they're saying all the stuff that he just read, the destruction of Jerusalem, the Antichrist, the Great Tribulation, and the day of the Lord was all fulfilled in 70 AD. When? When the Roman general and future emperor Titus sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the Jewish temple. So Titus sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple in 70 AD. That is true. That is history. But that does not fulfill the prophecy of the end times. Go ahead. Putting a permanent stop to the daily animal sacrifices. Go ahead. It identifies Babylon the Great. So Babylon the Great. Go ahead. Revelation 17 and 18. That you can read in Revelation 17 and 18, that great harlot amongst many waters. Who do they say this is? With the ancient pagan city of Rome or Jerusalem. So they can't even get that right because they said ancient Babylon is either the ancient city of Rome or Jerusalem. But if Jerusalem was destroyed, then how would that be a uh, great Babylon? See, they know who to go to with this madness, sister and brothers, people that don't read the book. But what are we going to do to say? Let's read the book. Is that all right? Amen. So let's go to Matthew, the 24th chapter, and let's read some book. Because what vain babblers don't do, they don't read. Or they'll read one or two verses, which I like to call drive-by verses, totally mess that up, and then get on the mic for an hour and a half and do a whole lot of yibber yabbing. So let's hit Matthew 24. We're not going to read all of this, sister and brothers, but we want to hit some key points here. And this is a place where a lot of these brothers go. Now, full disclosure, I ran into two brothers. This is a, long, a while back. Well, one recent and one a while back. Both of them were ex-ILG students, even ex-ILG teachers, if you really want to be truthful. And they both tried to tell me that all this stuff already didn't happen. Now, the first dude I met, he was pretty cool. I was able to reason with him. He was wrong in his doctrine, but I was still able to reason with him. The second dude, we about to bake a cake for him. So go ahead, Matthew 24, and let's read verses 1 through 7. When you get it, go ahead and read. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. Yes, sir. And his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another. So he that, told, go ahead that shall not be thrown down. So they showed Jesus the temple, and he told them there's not going to be one stone upon another that shall not be uh, thrown down. Go ahead, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So they asked three things. When shall these things be? The destruction of the temple. And what shall be the sign of thy coming? and the end of the world. So they knew what was going to happen, and they was asking Christ to break it down for them. They didn't just say what is going to be the, the end of destruction of Jerusalem and leave it at that. They also asked for the sign of his coming, which hasn't happened yet, and they also asked for the end of the world, which we know hasn't happened yet because we're sitting on it right now. Right. And look how Jesus answered in verse number 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. He always warns us about false prophets because they spread like wildfire. Go ahead, verse number five. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So they're going to come in the name of Jesus, and they're going to deceive many. Go ahead, verse number six. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, and see, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. So you're going to see wars and rumors of wars, but don't be troubled. All these things have to come to pass, but the end is not yet. Go ahead, verse number seven. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Now we want to pause right here and put on our thinking caps. If all this was fulfilled in 70 AD, sisters and brothers, why do we still have pestilences today? Why do we still have wars today? Why do we still have earthquakes today? Right. Why do we still have famines today, sisters and brothers? Right. Somebody right. is not reading this book and they're trying to deceive you. Do not give these Negroes one red cent. In fact, if you could, sue them. Mm -hmm. You ain't gonna get nothing, but sue them anyway. <laughs> okay, that was verse seven. In Skip down, seven. if you could, my brother, to verse number 11. Mm -hmm. And many false prophets shall rise 
and shall deceive many. Go ahead. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And we definitely are in that era today, sisters and brothers, because iniquity is going to abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse number 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Wait, wait a minute. Let's learn something on the way to learning something. It says, he that shall, mm -hmm. future tense, endure unto the end. The end is still future, right? Mm -hmm. It says, the same shall oh. be saved. Right. So nobody is saved right now, sister and brothers. The only thing that you saved from, if you baptize in the name of Jesus for remission of sins, is your past sins. But you got to walk in newness of life, sister and brothers, and you can get cut off. Because Paul even said he had to keep his own body under subjection or else he'll find himself as a castaway. But that's another lesson. We'll bake that cake another time. Go ahead, brother, verse 15, uh, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So the first brother I was talking with, we was chopping it up and we read this and he told me, he said, brother, this has already didn't happen. I'm like, when did this happen? He said, let me show you. So let me show you where he took me. Let's go to Colossians, the first chapter. Keep your finger in Matthew 24, because we're going to be back in and out of that all afternoon. But let's go to Colossians, the first chapter. Because the book says the gospel is going to be preached unto all nations, then shall the end come. And he said this had already happened prior to 70 AD. And I give it to him. He had a scripture. But let's see if he rightly divided the word of the Lord. Let's see if the scripture actually fits. Colossians, the first chapter, my brother. And let's read one verse. Let's read verse number 23. Colossians chapter 1, and let's read verse 23. Hold on, I still have some pages. I want everybody to see this. Because when they come to you with this, sisters and brothers, we're going to see how the book tells us to deal with it. Colossians chapter 1. Find Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians is right after that. Colossians 1, and Brother D. Lee. Let's read 23. Now, this is what the brother read to me to tell me that that Matthew 24 had already happened. What does the book say? If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled. So if you continue in the faith, being grounded and settled, go ahead. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. So he talks about the hope of the gospel, sister and brothers, the good news. Go ahead. Which ye have heard. Which you have heard. Go and, ahead. Now look at this part. This is what he read. And which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So then he closed the book and said, brother, According to what Paul wrote, this had already didn't happen. I had to think about this for a minute. Okay, it does say that the gospel was preached to every creature which is under heaven, but are you rightly dividing that? Mm -hmm. And I notice he didn't read nothing after this. But what are we going to do? We're going to read something after this. Stay in First uh, Colossians 1. And if you could, Dee skip down to verse number 25. Let's see why Paul made that statement. Verse 25. 25. Yes, sir. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. So we get the background of this, sister and brothers. Paul was preaching to the Colossians because Paul was the minister of the uncircumcision or the minister of the Gentiles. And he was telling them he was made a minister according to the dispensation of the Lord, which was given to him to teach to them to fulfill the word of God. And what else did he teach them? Verse 26. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. And now he's about to reveal a mystery to the Gentiles, which was hid from previous times, but now it was made manifest to the Lord's saints. And what's that mystery? Verse 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles. Go ahead. Which is Christ in you the hope of glory. So even the Gentile sister and brothers, this is the great mystery, can come into the congregation and they can have the hope of the same glory that Israel can have, which is salvation. Now look at verse number 28. Verse 28 really defines what verse 23 was talking about. Because that during the time of Paul, the commission was go and preach the gospel to every creature, every nation. And Paul was doing his job. But let's see what Paul's job was as well. Verse 28. Whom we preach. So we preach Christ Jesus to every man. Go ahead. Warning every man. We warn every man. Go ahead. And teaching every man. And we teach every man. Go ahead. In all wisdom. So what Paul was doing, he was teaching the Gentiles, everybody that he ran into. Of course, he didn't teach every Gentile that he saw. Well, let me say this. Every Gentile on the planet, Paul wasn't able to speak to. But the ones that he was able to speak to, he told them what thus said the Lord. 
and he also commissioned other uh, ministers in the household of faith amongst the Gentiles, and they also taught the other Gentiles what thus said the Lord, so the word of the Lord was spread as far as it could go. Start that again, verse number 28. Mm -hmm. Whom we preach. So we preach Jesus. Warning every man. Warn every man. Teaching every man in all wisdom. Teaching every man in all wisdom, praying that they can receive it. Why? That we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And if they repent and get baptized in the name of Jesus, we can represent every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Go ahead and read 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Amen. So verse 23, sisters and brothers, all it's saying is that Paul was part of the great commission to preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. But every creature didn't hear the gospel at that time, sisters and brothers, because that is toward the end times. Why do we know that? Let's go to the book of Revelation, which is the end. And let's clarify this. And like I said, the brother I dealt with who gave me that verse, you know, he was a cool brother. He was sincere. He just was in error. You got to keep reading, sisters and brothers. And I didn't get a chance to talk to him about this verse, but let's deal with it right now. Revelation 14, let's start at verse number one, and we're going to show you an example of the gospel being preached to every creature. Revelation 14 and 1, and y'all tell me if this has happened already. Revelation 14 and 1, the last book of the Bible, Revelation 14 and 1. When you get it, go ahead and read. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now we know this ain't happened yet, sister and brothers. This is still talking about future. The Lord, the lamb stood on Mount Zion with 144,000 having their father's name, his father's name written on their foreheads. Skip down if you could to verse number six. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Wait a minute, you know what? We gotta read verse number five because I run into too many knuckleheads saying that they parted 144,000. Verse number five, we'll see if they are part of this or not. Read verse number five. And in their mouth was found no guile. That means in their mouth was found no lies. But if you're teaching you part of 144,000, you're lying right now. So you got disqualified. <laughs> Go ahead. For they are without fault before the throne of God. Can you honestly say that you are without fault before the throne of God? Mm -hmm. It got quiet, didn't it? Yeah, so it is. So guess what? Don't worry about being part of 144,000. Just pray that the Lord give you salvation. Amen? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, verse number six. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. So another angel in the future is going to fly in the midst of heaven. Go ahead. Having the everlasting gospel. He got the everlasting gospel. Go ahead. To preach unto them that dwell on the earth. Now who is he going to preach this gospel to? And to every nation. To every nation. And kindred. And kindred. And tongue. And tongue. And people. So who's going to preach that gospel to every nation, uh, kindred, tongue, and people? This angel that the Lord is going to send during the tribulation to fly in heaven. So the Lord is going to make sure there ain't nobody walking around misinformed. You're going to know exactly what thus said the Lord, because when he throw you in the lake of fire, you're going to make that choice to be put in there. Amen. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, skip down to verse number nine. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice. So you got another angel in heaven following them, saying with a loud voice. Go ahead. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in their forehead, in his forehead, or in his hand. This shows you how merciful the Heavenly Father is, sister and brothers, because there's another doctrine being taught out here that they're going to sneak the mark of the beast on you. They can't sneak the mark of the beast on you, sister and brothers. You're going to know exactly what it is when you take it. And before you take it, the Lord's going to have an angel in heaven warning everybody in every language and every nation under the sun. So if you speak Croatian, he's going to warn you in Croatian too. Mm -hmm. Do not take that mark. Because if you do, next verse. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Go ahead. Which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. So if you decide to not listen to the angel, not listen to the warning of the Lord, not read this book about what thus said the Lord concerning the mark of the beast, he said you are going to drink out of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture in the cup of his indignation. Go ahead. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Go ahead and read verse number 11. Go ahead. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Forever and ever and ever, sister and brothers. This is a salvational issue. Do not take that mark, whatever the mark is, and when it comes on this earth, trust me, you will know. And the choice will be yours to take it and to not take it. Mm -hmm. Start at 11 again. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up 
forever and ever. Go ahead. And they have no rest day nor night. They have no rest day or night because they're going to be in that fire swimming with these worms. Go ahead. Who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So has this prophecy been fulfilled yet, sisters and brothers? No. So these cats don't know what they're talking about. But again, it's their job to try to deceive people. That's right. Let's go ahead to Mark 16 and look at the Great Commission. It's also in Matthew 28, but I like the way it's worded here in Mark to show this being fulfilled. Y'all still with us? Yes, Praise God in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Mark chapter 16, the very last chapter in Mark. And let's look at the Great Commission. And this is what Paul is doing in his day, and this is what we are doing, Lord willing, to this day and age. Mark chapter 16, and Brother D. Lee, we want to read verse number 1. Excuse me, we want to read verses 15 and 16. Okay. Mark chapter 16, and we want to read verses 15 and 16. Hold on, see here some pages. Mark chapter 15, excuse me, Mark 16. And if you could, my beloved brother, let's read 15 and 16. One of these days, I'm going to put my glasses on. <laughs> Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So the apostles did their part. Paul did his part. Timothy and them did their part. And we're doing our part today, sister and brothers. The Great Commission is teach this gospel to every creature, not just to Israel, but to all the sons of Adam, mm -hmm. Hamite, Ishmaelite, whosoever will, let him come. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is what the book say, verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Wait a minute. He says, he that it believeth, past right. tense, and is baptized, present tense, right. shall be saved, future tense. Sister and brother, this is an ongoing thing. Don't let nobody tell you that you're saved right now because you're not. Your name can be blotted out of the book of life. It's not put there in permanent ink. The Lord got some white out and some liquid paper for you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Start 16 again. He that believeth. He that believeth. And is baptized. So you got to get baptized, sister and brothers. Baptism is necessary for salvation, per the words of Jesus Christ in red. Go ahead. Shall be saved. You shall be saved. Go ahead. But he that believeth not. But he that believeth not, that's kicking against the word of the Lord and definitely kicking against Christ Jesus, what the book say? Shall be damned. Shall be damned. So again, the choice is yours. The Lord always gave us a choice from the Garden of Eden to this very day. He says, uh, keep my commandments and live or disobey and die. The choice is yours. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen, bro. Especially during this old wicked Christmas season. Y'all ain't getting not one thing. <laughs> but I digress. <laughs> I'm sure Ezra will do a lesson about that. Amen. Oh, yeah. Hey, praise God. <laughs> so now let's go back to Matthew 24. I told y'all to keep this finger there. So let's go back to Matthew 24. So we showed, Lord willing, the gospel of the kingdom is still being preached throughout all the world, but the end has not come as of yet. Now let's see what else they decide to mess up. We stopped at 14, Matthew 24, 14. Let's get some understanding now about the abomination of desolation. Matthew 24, if you could, brother, read 15 through 17, and then we'll skip. Matthew 24, 15 through 17, what does the book say? When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now Christ is going to give us a warning. He says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, you got to read, let him understand. What does the book say, 16? Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Go ahead. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Now, some brothers will go here and they say, see, this was already fulfilled. We can go in Luke and show you that this happened during the destruction of Jerusalem. But what Christ is talking about right now, sister and brother, specifically is the end time. We'll read that about Luke momentarily, but let's see what he's talking about the end time, specifically the abomination and desolation. He says, when you see him uh, standing in the holy place, Flee into the mountains. Why? 21 and 22. For then shall be great tribulation. For the, excuse me. For then shall be great tribulation. Yes, sir. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, 
nor ever shall be. So he says it's going to be a time of trouble, a great tribulation that has never since the beginning of time to this day ever shall be. And what's going to happen? Verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Go ahead. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Wait a minute. If all this was fulfilled back in 70 AD, why are we 2,000 years still here? So them days were not shortened, sister and brothers. Again, somebody is not reading this book. They are deceiving because they themselves have been deceived. Mm -hmm. But let's take a look at this because they say, uh, verse 15, the abomination of desolation was fulfilled by a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. So if you could, Brother Chas, let's put up these last two slides and read about this guy, a Greek uh, king named Antiochus Epiphanes. And they say that he is the abomination of desolation that Jesus was talking about. But let's see if that's the case. Antiochus Epiphanes 4, and Brother D. Lee, what does it say? Antiochus yes, sir. Epiphanes. Antiochus was a great, Antiochus was a Greek Hellenistic king. Yes, sir. Who ruled the Seleucid Empire from 175 B.C until his death in 164 B.C. So wait a minute, if this dude died in 164 B.C., then why did Christ tell you to warn you about him? And Christ was around 30 A.D. Why would he warn you about somebody that lived about almost 200 years before him? I shouldn't be asking these questions, should I? All right, <laughs> I'll, I'll shut up, go ahead. <laughs> his son... Amen. <laughs> he was a son of King Antiochus III, the Great. Yes, sir. Notable events during Antiochus' reign include his near conquest of Ptolemaic Egypt. Yes, sir. His persecution of the Jews of Judea and Samaria, and the rebellion of the Jewish Maccabees. Now, Antiochus was no Boy Scout. You know, he was a Greek king, and he ruled the Seleucid Empire, and he also uh, tried to con uh, conquest or conquer Egypt, which was a Ptolemy Empire. And the reason I got those two words in red because Seleucus and Ptolemy were two of the four generals of Alexander that reigned after his stead. And even the Bible had prophesied this. We'll read about that momentarily. So Antiochus, he persecuted the Jews of Judea and Samaria, and under him was the rebellion of Judas Maccabees. But let's see what else this guy did. Hit the next slide if you could, Brother Chaz, because he also persecuted our people. And let's see what he had done. Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, still in Wikipedia, and Brother D. Lee, let's talk about the persecution of the Jews. Go ahead. Persecution of the Jews. Swine was strictly unclean to, to Jews. So wait a minute, it says swine was strictly unclean to Jews? Mm -hmm. But again, like I said earlier, this is chitlin season. All you're gonna see on tables next week is them chitlins, that honey baked ham, and all that other abomination, right? Go ahead, and that's why we in captivity to this day. Go ahead. <laughs> but Diodorus wrote Antiochus sacrificed a great swine at the image of Moses and at the altar of God that stood in the outward court and sprinkled them with the blood of the sacrifice. So this guy was so wicked, he took an unclean pig and sacrificed it on the Lord's altar in his house and he sprinkled the blood on the outward court. And look what else he did, go ahead. Lastly, he forced the high priest and the other Jews to eat swine's flesh. So he forced our people, the high priest and the other Israelites to eat swine's flesh, but today we're doing it voluntarily. Go ahead. He outlawed Jewish religious rites and traditions, and the temple in Jerusalem was changed to a syncretic Greek Jewish cult that included worship of Zeus. So this guy was so wicked, history tells us that he sacrificed a swine on the altar of the Lord and he also uh, was dealing with a cult that worshiped Zeus. So this was Antiochus Epiphanes. Yes, he was wicked, but he was not the man of sin, the abomination of desolation that Christ Jesus talked about. Now let's go in the book of Daniel to see who this guy actually is that Christ was dealing with. He was married to his sister. I said that he was married to his full-blooded sister. I guess they kept it in the family, right? And if you look at history, because we do read history here at the Israel of God, she, he was her third husband. Her first two husbands were his first two older brothers. So she married her older brother, had children with him, he died. Then she married her middle brother, had children with him, he died. Then I guess it was Antiochus' turn at the end. 
I'm, and they had kids too. <laughs> so to show you that this brother wasn't a Boy Scout, let's now look at Daniel the 11th chapter. But just because he wasn't a Boy Scout don't mean that he was the one that Christ warned us about. Let's get right to the point. Daniel chapter 11, and let's read verse number 31. So when Jesus said uh, the abomination of desolation that Daniel the prophet spoke about, let's see exactly who Daniel was speaking of. We want to see if Antiochus fits this criteria. Daniel chapter 11. So it's fair enough to put everything on the table, right? Amen. Daniel 11, and let's look at verse 31. When you get it, d -Lee, go ahead and read, brother. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate. So if you just read it by itself, sister and brothers, and you don't read anything else with it, you'll try to insert Antiochus into it. Say, so yeah, he took away the sacrifice. He put an abomination on the swine, on the altar, this, that, and whatever. But you got to keep reading. Skip down to verse number 36. Go ahead. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. So this king, this abomination of desolation, Daniel the prophet wrote that he shall do according to his own will and exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Go ahead. And shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. Go ahead. For that that is determined shall be done. Now read verse number 37. It's going to give us another clue about this abomination of desolation. But we're going to see if this is Antiochus, 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Go ahead. Nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Well, this can't be Antiochus, sister and brothers, because he worshiped Zeus and he also married his sister. So he did desire women. He just desired the wrong one. Mm -hmm. So this can't be this guy. So let's see exactly who this guy actually is. Turn back over to Daniel the eighth chapter now. And sister and brothers, what we're doing, I hope it doesn't seem you know, redundant or tedious, but we wanna make sure we hit every point because you got these brothers out here that read one or two chapters or one or two verses. They don't rightly divide the word of truth and all they're doing is deceiving people. And it is late in the day to be deceived, especially nowadays because the Lord's return is imminent. And we wanna make sure we are on his right side and not get caught up with his sword, amen? So let's continue, my beloved brother. Let's go to Daniel, the 8th chapter right now. And for all the people that want to say the Bible is a plagiarized book or a fairy tale, the Bible, sister and brothers, it's a prophetic book, but it's also a history book. And we're about to read some history that the Bible talks about that was prophesied. Daniel, the 8th chapter and verse number 19. Daniel 8 and 19. What does it say? And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. Go ahead. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. So now again, uh, the, prop, the angel Gabriel was sent to Daniel to give him some understanding about what the end times. And look at what he wrote, verse 20. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. So Daniel prophesied the Medo-Persian empire, sister and brothers. That was the empire that took over right after Babylon had fell. Go ahead, verse number 22. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. Go ahead. And the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now again, when Daniel had wrote this, he was in the middle of the Medo-Persian empire, and now he prophesied that a king of Greece is gonna come, and he's gonna destroy the Medo-Persian empire. This is Alexander the Great. Go ahead, verse 22. Now that being broken, whereas four stood, stood up for it, Four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So again, when Alexander died, you had four of his generals that took over rulership. And we already read about two of them, Ptolemy and Seleucus. Then you had Cassander and Lysicomus. I believe that's how you pronounce his name. These are the four that ruled after Alexander. So again, if the Bible is a plagiarized book or is a bunch of fairy tales or if it's not true, then why did it prophesy about world events that happen, sister and brothers? And more importantly, why is it prophesying about a world events that are about to happen on this earth? Go ahead, read 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full. Yes, sir. A king of fierce continents and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. So in the latter times of the Gentiles kingdom, which we are in right now, it says a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences 
he shall stand up. And let's look at this guy, 24 and 25. And his power shall be mighty. Go ahead. But not by his own power. So he's going to have power, but it's not going to be his own power. He's going to get power from Satan the devil. Go ahead. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Because the book says he's going to make war against the saints and he will prevail. We got a whole lesson talking about the abomination of desolation. Go ahead, verse 25. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. So he's going to be dealt, he's going to be dealing big with witchcraft, sister and brothers. And witchcraft now is sneaking into many of these churches. Mm -hmm. Why do you got so many sisters out here burning sage? Mm -hmm. We got so many people out here burning different herbs talking about it's going to clear your house of spirits. I ain't seen in one place in the Bible where somebody got some sage and drove a demon out of anybody. If you're going to cast a demon out, you're going to cast him out in the name of Jesus and you got fasting and prayer. Amen? Amen, bro. So that mm -hmm. sage, put on your Thanksgiving turkey. Don't burn it. Amen? <laughs> That's all it's good for. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, brother. Where we at? Middle 25. Go ahead, 25. Mm -hmm. Start 25 again. Okay. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper mm -hmm. in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart. And by peace shall destroy many. So this guy's going to magnify himself in his heart. And they say he's going to come by peace, but he's going to destroy many. And look what else is going to happen to this guy. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So if nothing else proved that this was an Antiochus sister and brothers, it says he's going to stand up against the prince of princes, even Jesus, and he's going to be broken without hand. So the question I would have to ask is, when in history did we see Antiochus stand up against Jesus? He didn't, but somebody will, and let's read about him. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians now and let the Bible tell us who this abomination of destination is. He's also called the man of sin. He hasn't been revealed as of yet, but he will be soon, sister and brothers. And we ain't talking about Jeff Bezos or uh, what's his name, Bill Gates. <laughs> We're going to see who this is. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I heard a brother one time say Obama is the man of sin. I said, when did Obama sit in the temple of God? Then somebody else say Trump is the man of sin. Then other people talking about Joe Biden is the man of sin. <laughs> well, if Joe Biden is the man of sin, he forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so I seriously doubt it's that, brother. <laughs> Am I lying? <laughs> No disrespect, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Let the book tell us who the man of sin is. Amen? <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2. D. Lee, you're going to get me fired, man. <laughs> Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And let's read verses 1 through 4. Mm -hmm. Second Thessalonians 2, 1 through 4. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Amen. And by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So even back during the days of Paul, they were talking about the day of the Lord. But Paul is going to tell us what we need to look out for before that day happens. Verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means. Go ahead. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. So we talked about this earlier. The first thing that's going to happen is going to be a falling away first. What are they falling away from? They're falling away from the truth. Mm -hmm. You got brothers that left the class, and now they're talking about Merry Christmas, and they're eating pork chop sandwiches. And I'm not making a joke. I am dead serious. Yes. Because once the Lord takes that oil from your lamp, it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition. So that man of sin has to be revealed. He's the son of perdition. And what's he going to do? Verse number four. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. So he opposes and uh, above, exalt himself above all that is called God. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Or that is worship. Or that is worship. Go ahead. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. So this tells you right now that a third temple is going to be built, and once that temple is built in Jerusalem, this man of sin is going to sit in that temple as God, claiming himself to be God. But then again, you got the so-called scientists that claim they know everything. Well, no, brother, this ain't talking about a physical temple because the Lord says that you are the temple of the Lord. So that means the man of sin is going to be sitting in your mind. Okay, 
So you mean to tell me that the Antichrist is going to live in my mind rent-free? He's going to live in your mind rent-free too, right? Well, no, he can't because your ex is in your mind rent-free, so he ain't got room to be up in there. The one that dumped you a long time ago. <laughs> Go ahead, verse number 8. Mm -hmm. And then shall the wicked be revealed. So then that wicked is going to be revealed. After you see that temple, then you're going to see that wicked one being revealed. Go ahead. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. So the Lord is going to consume that antichrist, that man of sin, the son of perdition, whatever you want to call him, with the spirit of his mouth. Go ahead. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So the Lord is going to destroy the antichrist, or whatever you want to call him, when he returns. This did not happen in 70 AD, sister and brothers, and it definitely didn't happen in 163 with Antiochus. And who's going to give this guy his power? Because we read in Daniel that he's going to be powerful, but not of his own might. Who's mm -hmm. going to give him his power? Verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. The working of who? Working of Satan. So that's his father. Go ahead. With all power and signs and lying wonders. So with all power and signs and lying wonders. Read verse 11. This wasn't on the lesson, but go ahead and read verse 11. And this is a warning for all of us that we have to be careful. Go ahead. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. He said strong delusion. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That they should believe a lie. So keep on, like as I said, keep on out here playing church. Mm -hmm. Lord is going to send you a strong delusion that you're going to believe a lie. And when that happens, verse number 12. 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth. So what's the truth? And Jesus said, your word is truth, Father, the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. They're not going to believe the truth, but what? But had pleasure in unrighteousness. They want to walk around wicked doing what they want to do. Well, how they say it, do you, boo? Yeah, the Lord's going to do you too, boo. <laughs> you don't want him to deal with you. Let's go ahead, my, my brother. Let's go to Revelation, the 19th chapter. And we winding it down, y'all. We got a few more. Y'all still with us? All right, we're going to pick it up a bit. I want y'all getting mad at me saying, Tony P kept us here till sundown. <laughs> uh, second, where we, Revelation 19. Revelation mm -hmm. 19. Revelation we're going to pick up a bit, D. Lee. Mm -hmm. 1911. Yes, sir. I don't know if I want to read all of this, but let's see. Revelation chapter 19. So we're going to see when the Lord is going to destroy this man of sin at his coming. Yes, sir. Revelation 19. Go ahead and read 11. Yes, sir. Let's read verse 11. When you get it, go ahead and read. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So wait a minute. He said he saw heaven open. And he saw a white horse, and him that sat on was called Faithful and True, mm -hmm. and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. war. Has this happened yet, sisters and brothers? We can close no, the book no. and go on, can't we? I should have just read this and called it a day, right? <laughs> but we got to get some more. Go ahead, verse number 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Go ahead, read 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. So just in case nobody knew who this was, this is talking about Christ Jesus. But for time's sake, skip down to verse number 20. Verse 19. Verse 19. Got to read 19. Yes, sir. 19. Yes, sir. And I saw the beast. So he's talking about the beast. Go ahead. And the kings of the earth. Including the false prophet. Go ahead. And their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse. And against his army. We got to pause here for a second, D. Lee. So when they see Christ in the air coming back with an army, you're going to actually have some people that's bold enough and audacious enough to try to fight against him. Now let me show you how crooked and twisted man is. Man can be eating a bag of Doritos and see a Dorito that look like Elvis, and he'll bow down and worship that Dorito. He can burn some biscuits and turn around the back of the biscuit and see a silhouette of what they call the Virgin Mary. He'll put it in a glass case and charge people $25 to view that. So if you can worship a potato chip, and you can worship a burnt piece of toast, talking about this is the Virgin Mary, but when you see the Lord returning with a sword in his hand, you're going to try to shoot him? It's something seriously wrong with you, sister and brothers. That's right. That should be the time that you get some act right, amen? That's right. <laughs> you throw away that pork chop, you throw away that fornication, and you get down on your knees, you start getting to begging. My bad, I'm sorry, Lord. But no, man's going to try to fight and shoot him, and that's going to be the shortest war in history. Go ahead, verse number 20. 
And the beast was taken. So the beast was taken. Go ahead. And with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. Yes, sir. The man of sin and the false prophet. What's going to happen with them? With which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. And what happened to both of them? These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. This has not happened yet, sisters and brothers, but it's going to come on this earth very soon, and we pray that nobody's casting that fire with them. Go ahead, 21. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse. Go ahead. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. He's going to kill so many people, he ain't going to allow them to be buried. He's going to call the buzzers and all of the birds of prey to come and eat their flesh, sisters and brothers. Right. This is the guy that you don't want to make mad. Later for your supervisor, you can get another job, can't get another guy, amen? <laughs> so if you're going to get on anybody's side, get on the side of the one everybody kicking against, even Jesus. Yeah, that's right. So let's continue, my beloved brother. Oh, we got to go here now. Let's go to Matthew 24. Mm -hmm. We're winding it down, fam. Matthew 24. I'm going to have D. Lee do some speed reading. Matthew chapter 24. And if you could, Brother D. Lee, let's pick this up at verse number 27 through verse number 30. Mm -hmm. Verse number 27 to verse 30. And now we're going to deal with the guy I dealt with recently. And I'm going to show you all what he did. Matthew 24, 27 and 30. What does it say? For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, Amen. so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For, where, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. So go ahead, 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. I don't know how in good conscience anybody can teach that all this has been fulfilled because it says after the tribulation of those days, the sun is going to be dark, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. If you go outside right now, you're going to see that sun shining bright and yellow. Mm -hmm. So this has not happened, sister and brothers. And those that teach this madness, please put down your weed and pick up a book. <laughs> yeah, I said it. <laughs> he said it. I don't even think it's weed. I think it's something else. It might be that cush. <laughs> Where are we at? You read verse 30? Verse 30. Okay, so now after I deal with this, at, brother, at 30. you read 30. Okay, read 30, 30 please. 30. Yeah, read 30. Verse 30. Amen. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Amen. So we read twice. We read it in Revelation and we read in Matthew that you're going to see Jesus coming with great glory. You're going to see him in the heavens. Now, when I read this to this one brother that teaches that this has already been fulfilled, I guess he called himself having a little ace up his sleeve. Mm. I'm going to tell you all where he tried to take me. Let's go to Isaiah the 19th chapter. He told me verbatim, that's metaphorical. That's symbolic. <laughs> I said, how you get, get that? But brother, I'm going to show you something you ain't never seen before. Oh, okay. Yeah, show me a, a potato chip look like Elvis. You're right, I ain't never seen that before. <laughs> Isaiah 19, and just read verse number one. Now, this is his saying that what we read in Matthew 24 about Jesus coming in the clouds was metaphorical, and this is what he tried to bag it up with. Like we said, Paul warned us, you got to rightly divide the word of truth. Anybody can go to any scripture, but are they rightly divided? Now, look what this Jake put out there. Go ahead, 19 and 1. The burden of Egypt. Go ahead. Behold. The Lord rideth upon the swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. So it says, The Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. Go ahead. And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. And he closed the book and he was all proud of himself. See, brother, <laughs> this is symbolic. Just like Christ coming back in Matthew 24 was symbolic. He patted himself all on the back thinking he did something. You know, I was so embarrassed that he read this. I was ashamed that he actually read this in public. If you believe this, don't read that in public. But Jake ain't got no shame whatsoever. So I, I tried to be polite. I said, brother, let's stay in Isaiah 19 and see what this is talking about. Stay in Isaiah 19, if you could, delete. Skip down to verse number 19. We're talking about the same time period, for those who want to know what this is talking about, what does the book say, verse 19? In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, 
and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. Is there an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt right now? So this is talking about future, is it not? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, read verse number 20. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Go ahead. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the, of the oppressors, and he shall send them a savior and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Who's the savior, sister and brothers? Even Jesus. Mm -hmm. So this is still talking about future. We don't want to read this all, but skip down to verse 23. 23. Yes, sir. In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. And who are they going to be serving? Even the Lord Jesus Christ. We know this hasn't happened as of yet. Last place, uh, verse 24. Where are we? 24 and 25. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria even a blessing in the midst of the land. Now we know this ain't happened as of yet. It says Israel, the nation of Israel, the 12 tribes, shall be third with Egypt, these are the Hamites, and with the Syria, more Hamites, even a blessing in the midst of the land. Because God said he's the God of all flesh, sisters and brothers. If you want to say it's only for Israel only, then how you explain Egypt and Assyria being there with the Lord? Got to read this book. Go ahead, verse 25. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless. So wait a minute. The Lord of hosts is going to bless Israel, Egypt, and Assyria? What is he saying? Saying, blessed be Egypt, my people. Now why is he calling Egypt his people? Because if you serve the Lord, then you his people. And in that day, they're going to serve the Lord. Go ahead. And Assyria, the work of my hands. And who else? And Israel, mine inheritance. So sister and brothers, Isaiah 19, the whole chapter, read it on your own. It's talking about future. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the brother went to Isaiah 19 and 1, talking about it's metaphorical that Jesus is coming back in the cloud. That was so embarrassing. I was so ashamed for that brother. But like I said, Jake ain't got no shame whatsoever. But once I read, showed him that it was the future, ain't nothing else for me to say to him. Because if this is what you believe, then the Lord sent you a strong delusion that what? You might believe a lie. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Let's go now back to Matthew 24. And we got about four or five more after this, and then we'll close it out. Y'all still with us? Yes, Praise the Lord. Matthew chapter 24. I mean, the brother was proud, too, when he read that. He thought he was going to school me. I said, like, okay. <laughs> you schooled me, all right. You showed me how in uninformed you were. But that's okay. Lord willing, the Lord will bring him back and recover him. Amen. But until then, don't tell nobody else that, brother. Really, don't. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> Matthew 24, and it starts this at verse 31. Now, we know this didn't happen yet, but let's read it anyway. Go ahead. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. Amen. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So you know this didn't happen back in 70 AD. We weren't gathered in 70 AD. We were scattered in 70 AD. We fled from the destruction of Jerusalem. Let's get down, if you could, brother, to verse 34. We want to read verse 34. Verily, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, this is another thing that they mess up on purpose because the book says this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. So what they're assuming is that Christ was talking to the people of his day, talking about your generation will not pass until they see all these things. They see the return of Christ and they see all of his uh, elect being gathered. But let's take a look at that definition, this generation. Let's go now to Matthew, the 11th chapter. Matthew 12, excuse me. Matthew chapter 12. But we got to define this as well, too, because they'll look at, say, this generation means that the people in Christ's day was going to see the tribulation. They were going to see the destruction of Jerusalem, which they know it's the only thing that they saw. And they were going to see the return of Christ and abomination and desolation. But let's look at this terminology, this generation. We're going to stay in the book of Matthew so they don't think that we're running. And look, the good thing about the Bible, it explains itself and it interprets itself. So what did he mean But this generation shall see all these things? Matthew 12, let's read 41 and 42. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation. With who? This generation. So wait a minute. During the days of Christ, were the men of Nineveh resurrected in the first resurrection to judge that generation? He's talking about future, right? Go ahead. And shall condemn it. And they're going to condemn that generation because they were wicked. Why? Because they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold, 
a greater than Jonas is here. So Christ was telling those Israelites in his day that didn't believe in him, that didn't repent, he says the men of Nineveh is going to rise in judgment with this generation, and they're going to condemn it. Who else is going to rise? Verse 42. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. And it's talking about the queen of Sheba, who Solomon was dealing with. And she is going to rise up and condemn, quote, unquote, this generation. Did she resurrect and condemn those wicked Jews in that day? No, she didn't. So again, this is talking future. Go ahead and finish that. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. So a greater than Solomon is here. So when he was talking about this generation, he was talking about something that was going to happen in the future. Mm -hmm. One more place to prove that. Let's go to Luke, the 12th chapter. And we got about four or five more after that. Quick ones, and then we'll close it out. Luke chapter 12. 21, excuse me. Thank you, Dealey. Luke 21. Kind of transpose that. That's why we got the reader here. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Dealey. Luke 21. And for time's sake, Brother Dealey, we're going to start at verse number 24. Because there are parallels in Matthew 24 and Luke 21. Matthew 24 didn't really go into the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., but he is right here in Luke 21, but he's still going to bring it back to the future. And let's see how this set up. Uh, Luke 21, if you could read verse 24. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trotted down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And we know this hasn't been fulfilled yet because right now we are all speaking the king's English. Speaking the Gentiles' language. Go ahead, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Now look at what Christ did in verse number 24. He was talking about 70 AD and the destruction of Jerusalem, but he skipped right down 2,000 years later in verse 25 talking about the signs in the sun and the moon that we already read about in Matthew 24, which is going to happen during the tribulation in the future. Let's get down, if you could, to verse 27. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Hasn't happened as of yet, but we're going to see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Uh, go ahead and read 28. And when these things began to come to pass... Then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. So when you start seeing these signs, sisters and brothers, look up, for your redemption draws nigh. Skip down, if you could, brother, to 31 and 32, and the Bible is going to explain itself. Go ahead. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. When you see all these things that he talked about in Luke 21 and all the things he talked about in Matthew 24 coming to pass, then we know that the kingdom of God is at hand. Now let's read 32 with some understanding. Go ahead. Verily I say unto you. He said, verily I say unto you. This generation shall this not. This generation, the one that sees all the signs, not just one or two of them, all of the signs, go ahead. Shall not pass away. They shall not pass away when? till all be fulfilled. Does that make sense, family? So he ain't saying that the Peter and Paul in them in his day was going to see him returning and all that. He was saying the generation that sees all of these signs, that's the one that's going to see Christ's returns. Mm -hmm. Pray that makes sense. Let's continue, my beloved brother. Let's go to Revelation, the first chapter. Revelation chapter 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, but we got five quick ones after this, and then we will close it out. How many times I didn't say five? <laughs> I told you I need to put my glasses on. <laughs> but literally, we do have one, two, three, four, five after that. Amen. I'm trying to give y'all a little hope. Y'all got somewhere to go? That sun is still bright outside, is it not? <laughs> All right. Y'all ain't got nowhere to go. That sandwich ain't getting soggy. Just hold on a few more seconds. <laughs> Revelation chapter 1. See how they do me, Dealey? I see. See how they do me? That's all right. <laughs> I see. I see. Revelation chapter 1. And let's uh, read verse number one, Revelation 1 and 1. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. Amen. To show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. 
and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Amen. Skip down to verse number 7, and this is where we get the title for the lesson. Verse 7, Revelation 1 and 7. Go ahead. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. It says, Behold, he come with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. Go ahead. And they also which pierce him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And again, those people that teach this previous doctrine, they get stuck right here as a stumbling block. They say, well, yeah, the book says he coming with the clouds, but it also says they which pierced him shall see him. So the only ones that pierced him was around when he was alive. Again, let the Bible interpret itself. Let the Bible explain itself. Go to Zechariah the 12th chapter, brother. And after this is four more. I'm counting down right this time. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 12. Let's see where this came from. Zechariah chapter 12. It says, Behold, he cometh with the cloud, and every eye shall see him, and they which pierced him as well. So we're going to hear Zechariah 12. And D. Lee, we want to read verse number 9. We're going to skip. We're going to read verse number 9 through 11. Zechariah 12, 9 through 11. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The Lord's talking about the battle of Armageddon, which hasn't happened yet. Go ahead, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And let's see who's talking. Go ahead. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. So this is Jesus speaking by the mouth of Zechariah. He was in the Old Testament as well, sister and brothers. He didn't just start with Mary. He just came through Mary. So he said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Go ahead. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Go ahead. Verse number 11. In that day shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem as the morning of Hadad Ramon. Go ahead. In the valley of Megadon. So this all is going to take place, sister and brothers, at the battle of Armageddon, which is future when all nations are going to gather to fight against Jerusalem and the Lord is going to return. And we'll read about that in Zechariah 4 momentarily. But let's go to St. John in 19th chapter. We got to deal with him being pierced and who is going to see him at his return. Because again, people will look at a couple of verses they'll have a stumbling block and all of a sudden they'll get confused and they just want to make a brand new doctrine all together. And let's let the book explain itself, let the Bible interpret itself. When did they pierce him? When was that fulfilled? John 19, read verse 30. St. John chapter 19, we're going to read verse 30, and then we're going to skip. St. John 19 and verse 30. Hold on, I'll save some pages. And we got three more after this. I know y'all counting down. I'm, I got you. <laughs> St. John chapter 19 and verse 30. When you get Dealey, go ahead. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar. Yes, sir. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. So he was on the cross. He died and said, it was finished. Skip down to verse number 33. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. So they broke the legs of the other two that was crucified with him because they was trying to make sure that they died on that cross quickly. But when they came to Christ, he was already dead and they didn't break his legs. But what happened? Verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. Go ahead, 35. And he that saw it bear record and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. Go ahead, 36. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. So he had to still fulfill scripture, and these were done. They didn't break his bones because the scripture says, a bone of him shall not be broken. What else did the scripture say? Verse 37. And, it, and again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Did we just read that in Zechariah 12? Yes. But I thought the Bible contradicted itself. We read in the same thing in the New Testament that we read in the Old Testament, sisters and brothers. Why? There is no confusion. God is not the author of confusion. If you're confused, that's because you ain't read this book or you don't believe what you have read. 
So when it says in Revelation, they're going to look upon him who they have pierced. Christ is the one that has pierced. He suffered and he died for our sins. And he's going to return with great vengeance. He's not going to come back as a lamb. He's not going to come back all quiet, handing out Girl Scout cookies. He's going to come back as a lion of the tribe of Judah. And what do lions do? They tear stuff up, right? right. You don't believe me? Go stick your hand in the lion's cage and see if you get your hand back. Amen. <laughs> Three more places. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. Y'all still here? All right, praise God. I didn't lose you yet. Praise the Lord. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. So this is the return of the Lord. And I think it's obvious, sisters and brothers, from what we read, that that preterism is a false doctrine, because none of this that we've read has happened as of yet. If they try to place it back in uh, Jerusalem in 70 AD, they are greatly in error. And that's what the book says, they are error because the Lord didn't give them that spirit of understanding because they didn't want it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Yes, sir. Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Because then we read earlier that during Paul's day, you had people teaching that the resurrection had already passed. But Paul is telling us that the people are still asleep. Don't sorrow. What's going to happen? Verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So in the first resurrection, that we are blessed and, uh, to, and to be part of the first resurrection, the Lord will raise us up with a glorified body to be with him. Go ahead, 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Go ahead, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Go ahead. With the voice of the archangel. Go ahead. And with the trump of God. And that's the seventh trump, sister and brothers. He's going to descend from heaven. Go ahead. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we know for a fact this hasn't happened as of yet, but we are waiting for this to happen. Go ahead, verse 17. And we pray that we are part of it in verse 17. Go ahead. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. To meet the Lord in the air. To meet the Lord in the air, not to stay with the Lord in the air, to meet him in the air. Go ahead. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And as you know, where we're going to go next is Zechariah 14. And we got one more place after this. So he said we're going to meet the Lord in the air. This is not talking about a rapture. This is talking about at the seventh trump, the last trump, after three and a half years of the tribulation. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. And where are we going to go? Zechariah 14, let's read verses 1 through 5. Zechariah 14, verses 1 through 5. And we're going to close it out at Isaiah 11. Zechariah 14, 1 through 5. When you get it, brother, go ahead and read. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. So the day of the Lord cometh, talking about future, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of him. Go ahead. For I will gather all nations against Jeru Jerusalem to battle. And we read about that earlier in the battle of Armageddon. Go ahead. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Because another place in the book talks about the great and terrible day of the Lord. Go ahead, verse number three. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And we read about that in Revelation 19 when the Lord coming back with his whole army and the host of heaven. And what's going to happen when he returns? Verse number four. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. I want to talk to the Negro in clubhouse calling himself Jesus. I want to tell him to go to the Mount of Olives and do what? Go ahead which is before Jerusalem in the east, on the east. Go ahead. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. So if this Negro truly is Jesus, all he got to do is take off them crusty sandals, go to the Mount of Olives and stand on it, and let's see if the mountain splits. First of all, he ain't going to be able to get over there because he got a record, so he can't have a passport. <laughs> but let's just say they give him one as a buy. I will pay your ticket because I want to oh, see man. this. Go to the Mount of Olives and stand on that bad boy. And if it don't split, we all know for a fact that we already know you ain't nothing but a false prophet because you need a passport to go over there. When Jesus is coming, he coming from there. He ain't going to need no passport. Mm -hmm. and he going to dare somebody to ask him for one, too, when he get over there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Start that again, brother. Start verse 4. All right. Yes, sir. 
and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. Yes, sir. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. It's going to split in the middle when the Lord stands on it. Go ahead. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Go ahead and finish verse 5. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee, as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Go ahead. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And these are all the resurrected saints, and these are all the righteous angels in heaven, and they're going to all come with the Lord to take over this earth. Last place, y'all, Isaiah chapter 11. We made it. Amen. Isaiah chapter 11, because we know this ain't happened as of yet, but this is the final icing on the cake, just in case somebody still want to kick against it. Isaiah chapter 11. Let's see if any of this was fulfilled in 70 AD. We want to read Isaiah chapter 11. We want to read verses 6 through 12, and that should be enough. Isaiah chapter 11, and let's start this at verse number 6. When you get it, go ahead and read. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. So when the Lord is back on his holy mountain, and he's setting up his kingdom on his earth for a thousand years, it says the wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Go ahead. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. Go ahead. And a little child shall lead them. We know this ain't happened as of yet. Go ahead, verse number seven. And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Go ahead, verse number eight. And the suckling child shall play in the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. So you know kids are not playing with snakes right now. Snakes scare kids. They scare women, they scare some dudes as well too. So you know this ain't happened as of yet. Go ahead, verse number nine. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Sisters and brothers, if you still see red buckets of chitlins and Christmas trees up, you know good and well this has not happened as of yet. The whole earth is not full of the knowledge of the Lord. Go ahead, verse 10 and 11 and 12. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse. See how it's still talking about shall? Future. There shall be a root of Jesse. We know this is Jesus. Go ahead. Which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And that's what the Sabbath represents, a thousand uh, year day of rest. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. Now the Lord kicked us out of the land for being wicked, and now he's about to recover his people. Mm -hmm. So none of us right now are where we're supposed to be. We disobeyed our parents, and we got put in foster care. And that's where we at right now, on the captivity. We either in foster care or we in juvie hall. We are not in our own land. Start that again, verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. Go ahead. Which shall be left from Assyria. So our people are amongst the Assyrians. Go ahead. And from Egypt. And from the Egyptians. Go ahead. And from Pathros. Go ahead. And from Cush. The Ethiopians. Go ahead. And from Elam. And from Shinar. Go ahead. And from Hamath. And from the islands of the sea. So from the four corners of the earth, we are still in captivity. So this has not been fulfilled as of yet. This only happens when Christ returns. Uh, go ahead, verse 12, and that should be it. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So, sister and brothers, Lord willing, you see through this lesson and through the definitions that we gave you all that this doctrine of so-called preterism is a false doctrine. You got too many prophecies that have not happened as of yet. So if you run into somebody that, you t that teaches that we have all this has come to pass or that all the signs of the Lord's coming in the clouds is nothing but symbolisms and metaphors, sister and brothers, plain and simple, they are false prophets. Because according to the book, it says, behold, he cometh with the clouds and every eye shall see him. Mm -hmm. I thank you for your time and I pray somebody was edified. Amen. Amen.